Hi, everyone. It's V from the James Beard Foundation here with Emily Rothkrug and Evan Dash. Um, we're letting folks trickle in a little bit more, um, but wanted to say hi and thanks for joining us. Um, we'll give it about another minute before we get started, but in the meanwhile, you'll be able to just kind of like stare at me and Emily and Evan as we like readjust our position, <laughs> make sure it looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Get a sip of water. Um, yeah, so just hold tight for one minute. Um, while y'all are getting settled in, uh, if you've not been on a GoToWebinar before, you'll notice on the side of your screen, there's an area where you can add questions or chat. If you have a question or chat specifically for me or Emily, just make sure that you click send privately. And if you have just something you generally want to say to the group, you can go ahead and just put that in chat, but note that um, while you're getting used to everything. We just got a big jump in how many folks are joining, so I guess it's working. 202, right. 203, Good. 205 it tends to be this week <laughs> where folks can actually log in. The first couple of minutes, it's, it's sometimes hard to connect, so we're just giving everybody a couple more minutes. <laughs> All right, so we are pretty close to um, the full class here, so I'm going to get just get started. I want to say again, thank you all for joining us for this series um, here at the James Beard Foundation. You know, our motto is good food for good, and more recently, we've been talking a lot about the motto of open for good. Um, you know me and Emily from the women's leadership programs and from all of the in-person contact that we've been able to have with everyone, helping them to grow or open their businesses. And what we want to do now is transition to an online platform where we can continue to provide quality education and quality up-to-date information for y'all on the topics that matter most to you. So you'll see in this week, we're going to be talking about insurance. We're going to be talking about law. There's some fun stuff on Friday with Quarantinis with Gina Shevrasani and um, Monica Pierce. Um, <laughs> all with the goal of providing a space for us to continue to gather as a community and also to take the approach that our programs have taken um, all year, which is really to take the scary out of what's happening and to have a really honest peer-to-peer -peer, casual conversation about what we know as it's coming in, understanding that that information is going to change and evolve um, and that we just want to keep chasing that truth and keep making sure that everyone feels really included, really informed. Um, and that we continue to fight for restaurants to be seen both on the federal and state level, but also, with, also within our own communities. Um, so these webinars are a little different than others that you may be joining in the fact that these are really meant to be peer-to-peer -peer conversations. So it's the disclaimer is that while Evan is an insurance broker, he may not be your insurance broker. And for those reasons, the things that he suggests or talks about are really the things that he knows and can share with us, um, but it is in no means a, a formal consultation. Same with when we talk to the lawyers, they're gonna be speaking in broad terms and they're gonna be talking about what they know as if they were speaking to a friend. So it's just important to keep that mentality as we're going through, um, that the things that he's gonna suggest and that folks are gonna talk about all week really are 
like if you could have a behind the scenes conversation with one of these experts and just get like a real basic layman's understanding of what's going on. Um, so keep that in mind and keep that disclaimer at heart as we're going through. If, if he tells you something and then your broker says that doesn't work for this state, um, you know, we're, we're trying to give as much information as we possibly can in the friendliest of ways. Um, you can also go to our website, jamesbeard.org slash relief. That's where we're going to be updating all of the resources. It's sometimes three and four times a day that site is getting updated with things like the financial relief packages, other webinars, um, other things that partners are doing, uh, kitchens that are popping up in your area to help serve out of work hospitality workers um, and other various relief efforts. Um, we're going to be doing these webinars every day at 2 p.m. That schedule comes out on Friday. It's also on the Relief website if you want to check it out and see if there's anything else that makes sense for you. Um, and now I want to introduce Emily Rothkrug, who is going to talk a little bit more about just the mechanics of how these will run and how you can best interact. Thank you so much and hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so on this slide, I'm just going to run through a couple of quick kind of rules of the road. Um, we are going to leave time for questions at the end, but I just want to stress that if you have any questions throughout the webinar, um, you can submit them using the questions function on the control panel. And if you have any trouble finding that, just let us know using the chat function. Um, and if you can't find that, you can send me an email and I will try to help you find it. But feel free to submit them kind of as we go along. And if it doesn't get answered, we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Uh, we are recording this, so we will definitely send out a link to all of you and we'll post it on our website after the program wraps. Um, and I think that is pretty much it. So with that, I will turn it back over to V. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so as I said, we have our friend here, Evan Dash of the Dash Love Insurance Company. He is uh, Judy yes. Nee in Philadelphia's insurance broker. Um, and Evan, tell me a little bit about yourself, about being an insurance broker and kind of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, of course. So, hey guys, I'm Evan Dash. I'm a vice president over at Dash and Love. Uh, we are a division of Risk Strategies Insurance Brokerage. Uh, I'm based out of Philadelphia. We are a fourth generation family business that's been going for a little over 90 years at this point, which is still crazy and surreal to say <laughs> and hard to believe it's still happening. Um, but a large part of those 90 years, even though we're a generalist agency and we insure all types of businesses, all types of organizations, uh, we've always insured restaurant clients going back to, you know, the, the 30s or 40s when the liquor laws were called dram shop laws. It was, it was something we've just done forever. So um, it's always been a large part of our business. And we've seen not only the restaurant industry and kind of that side of the aisle evolve and change and grow over time, but we've also worked with these insurance companies over time and seen how they've structured their policies, how they've structured the insuring agreements, how they've handled these types of claims. Um, and, you know, for, for background, we've worked with everyone from a small mom and, shop, mom and pop pizza shop to celebrity chefs on Food Network that have restaurants all over the country to James Beard Award winners. So there's, you know, there's no one size fits all solution and everything is different depending on the context of your restaurant. However, the principles largely remain the same. So I think what we can do is kind of take what is the intention of these insurance policies, the knowledge of how they're structured, and try to find a way to provide some kind of clarity on what's going on because it's unprecedented for you know, any number of different reasons. Yeah, thank you, Evan. Um, and I know that you, yeah. Emily, you might have to pass controls to Evan now so that he can uh, put up the slide about the different types of insurance policies we're going to be talking about today. Um, Second. Just to give you guys uh, a couple ideas of the different things we'll be able to cover. And we will be okay. covering the Thomas Keller um, efforts as well, so stay tuned for that. Yep. I am trying to figure out how to give this full screen. Play from this. Uh, ah, here we go. That should work. Okay. So, as V noted, before we dove into all of the pressing questions and all of the relevant questions, which I'm sure pertain primarily to business interruption coverage, what I wanted to do was start and take a step back and take a minute to review what policies are typically in place for restaurants, what policies are typically in place for food and bev type organizations, 
what those policies cover and what the intent of those policies are. So I think the first thing, which is really the foundational policy for your business is a business owner's policy, otherwise known as a BOP, B-O-P, it's just a short acronym, or a package policy. They call it that because it literally packages property and general liability insurance together onto one policy. So whether you own the building you exist in, whether you own your ovens and stoves and tables and chairs, uh, that's where the property coverage would be picked up. It would also be where your general liability coverage is found. And general liability coverage for the record is any claims made against you of third party bodily injury or property damage. So uh, within the business owner's policy, all that good stuff of product liability, spoilage, business income and business interruption, equipment breakdown, uh, all of that stuff and all of those ancillary coverages that are really foundational to the business are covered within that business owner's policy. I would assume uh, everyone on the call has one of those or I would, I would hope has one of those. Uh, the next is workers' comp, which is statutorily mandated in all 50 states, um, regardless of if your employees are 1099. Um, you can get that through your payroll carrier. You can get workers' comp coverage through ADP or a paychex, or you can get it through your insurance broker. Most uh, insurance companies are writing it right now, and frankly, most insurance companies are writing it for very, very cost-effective uh, premiums. So uh, that would be a way moving forward to work to save some premium dollars. The rates for workers' comp across the board are just softening while the other lines are actually hardening and getting a little tighter. So uh, that's workers' comp. Employment practices liability is not something that is mandated to have by the state. It's not something that you, have, you need to open your business if you sign a lease, but it's something that we advocate all of our restaurants to have. Uh, it covers any first or third party, meaning your own employees or any customers, uh, claims made against you alleging any sexual harassment, wrongful termination, discrimination, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is invaluable coverage um, as we find that the claims frequency is, is ticking most certainly up and up. A lot of times these policies are pretty competitively priced and usually have a higher deductible. Uh, so you don't use them unless you really need them, unless you kind of have a severe claim coming in. Uh, you can find employment practices sublimits, uh, sublimits of coverage within the larger business owner's policy. Uh, that can be a little problematic because generally the insuring agreements and what they will or won't cover, uh, what types of employment practices claims that are sublimited within business owner's policies is a little more restrictive. Um, so we always advocate for a separate standalone policy, <clears throat> which frankly is, is, is not that expensive. Um, cyber liability insurance, if you are taking credit cards, you have a cyber liability exposure. Um, you know, Square or whomever you're paying, whoever is doing your payment processing might tell you that they uh, will assume all liability for it. That's all well and good. You better believe that if there's a breach and the breach traces back to someone who swiped their card at your restaurant, that your own business is getting sued for it. So uh, it's something that we advocate all of our insureds to have. Uh, again, because the exposure uh, isn't huge, it's not incredibly expensive. Um, you know, you also have your employee information, your employee data. Um, if you're providing health insurance, you have their HIPAA information. Um, and a lot of times you have their direct deposit and bank information. So if that info gets out as well, that's another cyber liability type uh, claim. On the auto side, if you have cars that are titled to the business, you got to put them in the business's name. So you need a business auto policy. Those essentially work the same way uh, as a personal auto policy. Essentially, the same coverage is provided there. Uh, the difference is that uh, we advocate all of our restaurants have hired a non-owned auto liability. That's typically found within the business owner's policy as well. Uh, but what that is, is it provides coverage for the business if any employee is using their personal car for company purposes. Say your sous chef is going down to the market to pick up fish uh, or whatever it may be. They get in an accident. Whomever they hit finds out that they were making that errand and on the road at that time because they were running an errand for the business or because they were using their personal vehicle for company purposes. Uh, the business gets sued for that. Uh, and so we want coverage for the business for that exposure. So that's what hired and non-owned auto liability is directors and officers coverage. It is if you have a board of directors. So for larger restaurant groups and for larger operations, uh, if you have a board, uh, the individual directors and officers of that board could be sued 
for decisions they make in their capacity as directors and officers or simply by their position as a director or officer within the organization. So maybe not applicable to everyone on the call, but certainly something to think about as you move forward. Uh, and then lastly is an umbrella, which just provides additional limits of general liability coverage. So typical business owners policies come with either a $1 million per occurrence limit, which is subject to a $2 million general aggregate limit of coverage, or a $2 million per occurrence limit subject to a $4 million general aggregate limit of coverage. That sometimes for your operation might be enough, sometimes it might not be enough. So uh, an umbrella policy provides additional limits of liability coverage if you exhaust those primary limits uh, within your business owner's policy. So uh, before I get going, V, any questions, comments, uh, or you want me to move along to the next slide? Yeah, I think that that was a really good introduction to what we're going to be talking about and covering what each thing is for, um, et cetera. I know, um, and I think it's on your next slide, the thing that folks are very interested in now, of yeah. course, business I'm interruption. Sh I'm so, sure. Yeah, so that's, business, that's the big. That's it. <laughs> where does that yeah, that's fall? The, that's the big matzo ball right now. Where does that fall within these categories? It's in the business owner's policy. It's so business, business interruption policy. coverage, yep, civil authority, which I'm sure everyone is hearing about now, that's also contained within the business owner's policy. Uh, you know what, I'll pull up, I'll pull up the next slide. Um, tell me, tell so me about the business the, interruption insurance. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, this is the large uh, matzo ball, meatball, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, on everyone's mind right now. And what I think is important to remember uh, is these, let's say, declinations, these unreassuring conversations you might have been having with your broker, with your attorney, whatever it might be, it's not just you. It's not just the food and bev industry. It's not just restaurants, doctors, lawyers, condominiums, manufacturers, wholesalers, construction workers, you know, whatever it may be. Everyone, unless they have a specific policy, is in this situation. So everyone's more or less in it together because insurance policies at their core are a contract. And what that contract or what that insurance policy states is what a carrier will pay, when they'll pay, how it'll pay, how coverage will apply, when it will apply, when it won't apply, the limits at which it will apply. That's all the information, those contractual clauses that are all contained within your insurance policy. That's why your insurance policy is you know, 200, 300 pages. It is a litany of contractual statements that the insurance company is agreeing by the premium that you pay them to uphold. And typically, within most common insurance policies, again, I, I haven't seen your policy. I, I don't know what your policy contains, but the Insurance Services Office, ISO uh, for short, adopted, which, you know, frankly, most insurance companies use ISO forms the business interruption coverage component within an ISO form states that in order for business interruption coverage to apply or for it to be triggered, you know, for coverage to begin, there needs to be direct physical damage to covered property caused by a covered cause of loss. So that verbiage is standard in, again, all policies that exist primarily that are issued by ISO. So again, it's not you, you're, just because you don't have it, your broker didn't do a bad job. It's not, no one is targeting the food and bev industry specifically. It is, it is present in all of these policies. And what V and I were talking about previously is it came onto these forms after the SARS scare pandemic outbreak, you know, whatever you want to call it back in the early, early aughts. So this has been on policies for going on 20 years now, and it's just now kind of kicking in. So mm -hmm. it's nothing, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a surprise. It's not something that someone did wrong. It's not someone that's, you know, trying to take coverage away from you. It is in most of the policies. And again, I don't know your policy. I haven't read it. I, I you know, as V said in the beginning, I can't speak directly to that, but generally, that is the intent of the business income coverage component. And that's why you've either been told or you've already received a declination from your insurance company. And the same concept, that same idea of direct physical damage to covered property by a covered cause of loss 
exists within the civil authority component within business income coverage. So, you know, the best way to think about that would be if, you know, you exist on a block and there was a massive fire to one of the other uh, tenants or one of the other buildings and the city had to come in and shut down the entire block for four months because it was a big fire and they, you know, no one could access the street. That is when civil authority coverage would come in because the cause of loss to other property was covered, i.e. fire, and it was caused and it resulted from direct physical damage. So that's where the logic of these insurance companies is. That's kind of why they're relying on this clause over and over again and why up until this point there's been no movement on these insurance companies paying these business interruption claims. Because from what I've seen and what I think all of you have seen at this point is that the insurance companies are really kind of digging their feet in on this clause and saying, listen, we specifically excluded this. We have this in all of our contracts. We specifically wrote this in there to intentionally not pay for these claims. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. There are a myriad of different initiatives going on at the state, federal, local level. I think just today, a lawsuit, uh, a bill came to New York to force insurers to pay business income claims. I know it was actually voted down in New Jersey last week. There's one in Ohio. There's one in Massachusetts. Um, you know, they're, they're all over the place. But that is what the point of these bills is, is to essentially supersede the contract, to supersede the language of the contract and to force insurance companies to do what I think everyone believes is the right thing in this scenario. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Evan. Thanks for clearing that up. So, it basically comes down to even though the governor of the state or or whoever it is the health department is saying to businesses you must close you must reduce capacity and that is a directive that is a law the underlying cause is still virus and that is still excluded and that's why we're in this situation now because if the underlying cause was fire then that would be the reason but the government is closing because of the virus and the virus is excluded. So that's what's the problem. That's exactly that's a, that's exactly right. They've insulated they they've in theory insulated themselves two ways. One, they've insulated themselves from the physical damage component because they're arguing that a virus doesn't contain physical damage. And secondly, right. they've insulated themselves from the cause of loss component because virus or communicable disease is a covered cause of loss. Again, I'm not a claims consultant. <laughs> I do not right. work for a claims department, but that's kind of the logic where everyone is is going, and that's that's the logic that we've seen. So it's almost like a double whammy of insulation from an insurance company standpoint, where they can point to and at least attempt to say that, hey, this, you know, this this language is there. This language is in the contract, and you know there are a number of different types of interruption claims that might not be covered. Pandemic just happens to be one of the many, and. You know, yeah. unfortunately, it's just a situation we find ourselves in. So that's, from my understanding and my perspective, where this situation stands. And that's why yeah. the, you know, these initiatives at the state, federal, all these kinds of levels are trying to essentially get insurance companies to act against what they feel is their self-interest with, with in terms of the verbiage and the policy. Right. Makes a lot of sense. I know that was helpful the first time I heard it too, understanding the why behind it and where it was protected. And also that there are efforts to kind of um, supersede those contracts, which is, you know, comes with its own set of troubles and issues. And then when is a contract valid? When isn't it, you know, and all of that business? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's a completely separate. Yeah. And that's, right. that's honestly, the issue. I honestly, I, Frankly, I find it a little bit disingenuous that the insurance companies are worried about precedent and, you know, well, if you supersede this, you, you can supersede anything. You know, who's to say that anything is safe? But that's, you know, I think that's a little bit of a red herring argument personally. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that, that's also here. what they're saying. So yeah, tell yeah, exactly. me what you know um, about the Thomas Keller bit a little bit. He is trying to prove physical damage as per that article. And is that something that you think that's what he's doing? He's trying to prove that the virus did, in fact, cause physical damage. That's the rub. So from what okay. I've read uh, from, you know, from CNN, from Eater, from wherever, wherever that article is posted, because it's, it's a huge deal. I mean, Thomas Keller right. is a huge deal and his restaurants are a huge deal. And if he's suing, it's, it's by virtue of all that a huge deal. So uh, where I've read that, from what I've read, the precedent that his attorney is trying to argue is exactly that, that this mm -hmm. virus is causing physical damage. And because it's causing physical damage, we can therefore trigger the business interruption component. Now, 
I have, you know, these attorneys are a lot smarter than me and paid a lot more money than I am. And I don't know if it's going to be successful. I have absolutely no idea. I would hope it is. But from what I've read, that seems to be the legal uh, argument that they're approaching that, you know, this has caused physical damage. And, mm-hmm. you know, something that to, to go back on with, um, I'm sure we all remember Hurricane Sandy. Well, when, you know, when that happened, we actually had some degree of success with our clients who were in the New York, New Jersey area filing those civil authority claims. Because even though physical damage might, you know, even though physical damage might have happened um, hundreds of miles away from where their restaurant was, some carriers, some insurance companies accepted the argument that, well, you know, these blew down. The restaurants don't exist anymore. Uh, and the governor had to shut down the state. And because the governor had to shut down the state, they argued that, you know, that physical damage that resulted from the hurricane or the flood actually could trigger the civil authority. So it's not something that's impossible. And it's not something that all carriers agreed to. Some some bought the argument, some didn't. But it is, you know, it's an example of, of how these things have kind of worked in the past. Right. It makes a lot of sense. So, what well, you know, what I'm hearing is that it's coming to legislatures and we know Catherine Miller and the other half of the impact team, Ashley Kosiak, are working also on the bills and legislations that are coming through and um, getting the most up-to-date information on that. So we will uh, catch up with them and see if there's been any um, movement or if there's any things that chefs can be doing right now to advocate in that particular uh, avenue. And we'll add that to the jamesbeard.org slash relief resources and updates that come out. So if you guys have any more questions about that, certainly we'll be following up on that topic. Um, Evan, tell us what else you got. I see three more slides, so I know there's a little bit <laughs> more info to share. What what can we be doing yeah. with our insurance company? Like, how so can that, they help outside of this business interruption thing? It's a good question, and you know, listen, as as a insurance broker, uh, I I exist between you guys and the insurance company, right? We all brokers work for you for the restaurant, but we. Sh- you know, our our goal is to convey the information that's coming from these monoliths, these black boxes, these insurance companies, as well as we can. So what we've seen from these insurance companies is not that they're kind of existing in some unholy alliance to screw everyone over. They are doing some things to, aside from the business interruption coverage to try to make it easier on everyone else in the current moment, which are leniency <clears throat> on payment, cancellations, and renewal underwriting. So a large majority uh, of our insurance companies, and again, I don't know if this applies to your insurance company or not, uh, whomever you're insured with, are suspending cancellations. So you don't have to pay your insurance bill for 60 days or 90 days or however long it might be, and they will keep the policy in force. So they're being lenient on payment, lenient on cancellation terms. You know, it's not, you didn't pay for two weeks, we're sending out a notice of cancellation. Hey, we didn't receive it on the third week, your policy's canceled. They're being, certain carriers are being flexible in terms of how long they can go without keeping that policy uh, canceled without receiving payment. They're also being pretty lenient on renewal underwriting. So if your policy comes up for renewal uh, within this policy, you know, within this term, they are accepting. uh, We've seen companies who are essentially accepting the uh, uh, expiring terms and expiring underwriting information and just issuing renewal terms based on that. So trying to save you the headache of the paperwork, of the audits, you know, of all that stuff. Now, having said that, although they're being lenient on payment and cancellation, it's not a waiver. It's a deferral. So they're eventually, whenever this gets up and running and whenever, you know, everything gets back to normal, hopefully much sooner rather than later, they are, I'm assuming, eventually going to want that payment back. So it's not like they're just waiving the payment of the 90 days. That policy and that contract is still in force, but they're trying to give you some leeway and some flexibility and frankly protect you because if your, you know, your business is still there, if someone slips and falls in front and files a slip and fall lawsuit against you, you want your general liability policy or you know your business owner's policy to pick that up. So there, even though you're not operating, there still are exposures present. So they're being a little lenient on those things and allowing the policies to stay in force without payment being made directly. They're also, I mean, <clears throat> what they can also do is just clearly communicate to you what their updates are. You know, as V noted, these things are changing hourly, daily, weekly. It's, it's, you know, something could happen while we're on this webinar and uh, their policies change. And, and it's, you know, really the responsibility of the insurance company and of the insurance brokerage 
to convey that information to you specifically. So having that information, knowing how these things are changing can impact how you, you know, how you as a business then relate to those changes because something might have caused you to act a certain way one day, but if those changes, if a company change happens, you might be able to you know, kind of adopt or, or reject or, you know, augment your strategic path. So there are a number of different things that they can do. Unfortunately, right now, those things don't seem to include paying business interruption claims, but uh, we shall most certainly see. But they are, you know, they're not trying to, um, you know, they're, they're trying. Is, is what I would say, and, and that's that's how they can ha- that's how they can help at this point. So I would reach out to whomever uh, your current broker is, or if you go, you know, if you go direct uh, for coverage to find out what your company's policy is on payments and cancellation, so that you know you're not scrounging up the last money that you might have in the cash flow to pay an insurance policy if you don't need to make that payment for 60 days. So there are you know, there are things that you can do, uh, or there are things the insurance company are doing that are trying to help. Mm. Um, I'm going back uh, just based on some of the questions that we have here. Uh, that business interruption civil authority clause, it does seem like some folks have in their policy that's something that says, like, they'll pay for the actual loss of business income you sustain and necessary extra expense caused by action of civil authority that prohibits access to the, descri- to the described premises due to direct physical loss or damage to your property. That to me sounds basically the same thing, like they would pay if there was a a covered clause, but because virus is, you know, written out as excluded, it's still going to come back to the same thing. But that's exactly right. Yep. State by state. It won't be, sorry, it won't be a federal issue. It it doesn't seem like there'll be a sweeping federal issue that will solve this, but it will be state by state. They're voting on these um these changes, these post-contract changes, state by state. And like I said, we'll have Catherine Miller um, and Ashley way back in as to what chefs can be doing on a state by state level, or at least by a region by region level. But it does sound like it's that same thing. It's the same, um, same issue. Yeah, that's, a, it, it, that, that's, that's exactly right. And, and that sound, that the way you read that off was a phenomenal copy and paste. So kudos to whoever answered the question <laughs> because, or asked the question because they nailed the verbiage in the insurance uh, part yeah. of their policy. And in the, these exactly right. So that, that's all true and that's all within the policy. But again, it needs to be triggered by direct physical damage to additional property by a covered cause of loss. And I think where, Again, back to Thomas Keller's lawsuit, back to what these state and federal laws are doing, where the rubber is trying to hit the road is making this a covered cause of loss. And if the insurance companies won't do that, just overriding them and, and forcing them to pay. So it's it's the same concept, whether it exists within the civil authority component or whether it exists within the larger business income coverage, that these insurance companies have insulated themselves via language to make claims as a result of this because they're not considering it a covered yeah. cause of loss. Again, your policy might, I don't know, you might have a specific policy that does this. I'm only speaking in terms of how the ISO adopted forms work. So yeah. um, again, you read your policy, call your broker, make them earn their commission. I mean, that is what they do. They should earn and they should read these policies and tell you specifically if it is or isn't covered and point to it. So um, that, you know, the, you're exactly right. Whether it happens at the state or the local or the federal level, I don't know. I hope it happens to one of them. Uh, I know Maxine Waters is really banging the drum at the, at the federal level and the state level. It's coming from a, from a number of different sources, but that's, yeah, you're exactly right. That's where it would come from. Awesome. Um, is there something on the, on the next two slides or do you want to move to questions that are more things like they can be asking the insurance for? Yeah, let's, I just want to go over this. this oh, part how quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, you know, there's, there's, two schools of thought right now that might be going on, or you might have heard two things, which is one, file a claim, get a claim denial, uh, and then at that point, you could potentially apply for the loan through the CARES Act or through the SBA or whatever is happening. Uh, And that might certainly be true. Um, I don't think we know how those acts have shaken down yet or the, you know, the specifics of how those loans would work, although I would encourage absolutely everyone on this call to investigate it. The SBA uh, and the relief funds have just been issued a ton of money by the federal government and are offering interest-free loans, which essentially turn into grants. Uh, I would really strongly advise everyone to look into that on their own. But what I can say from my perspective 
is that whether or not you file a claim, whether or not you have a claim denial, what is of the utmost importance when you go through this process is, and this relates back to the SBA loans or you know, back to getting those loans through the relief fund, have your paperwork ready to go. Have the financials, have your P&Ls, have your operating statements, have anything you might need to submit to the insurance companies in working order. Because from my experience, the things that get handled the quickest are the things that get in the quickest. And if, you, you know, if you're liaising from someone from the SBA who's coordinating 10,000 requests a day and you have six out of the necessary 10 documents, it, it essentially you know, doesn't do any good for anyone involved. So I would just advise everyone to call their accountant, call their attorney, or if you do the books on your own, get the paperwork in working order, make sure you have everything ready to go so that when those floodgates open and when you approach the SBA and uh, you can really kind of be first in line to, to go forward and give them all the information needed to potentially get reimbursed. Great. Um, let's see if we have... Uh, is there like a, a list of questions that they should be asking the broker? Or is there a list of like um, things they typically have to have ready when they're filing a claim? Or is it really like your, all your financial documents and anything else? Yeah. So business income claims specifically, you're going to want your P&L ready. You know. uh, because what they're going to do, yeah, they're, they're going to look specifically for, okay, you know, if business income coverage is income, is actual income we lost by not being able to operate, they want to go back and be able to verify, you know, in the month of, where are we, is it April, is it March? I don't know, I think it's the end of March. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, in, from mid-March to mid-April, what was your actual uh, wages this past year. What are, you know, what could we reasonably be expecting to make in those 30 days? And then how, you know, how can we reimburse you? So uh, I would have your P&L ready um, and all those other more operational type documents ready to go. Got it. Going back to interruption coverage or proper claims, would food loss mm -hmm. be considered a claim or does it all still go back to the virus thing? Like they were shut down because of the virus and everything that happens within that is sort of going back to that core cause. It's, it's a good question. So typically spoilage coverage or something like that would be covered within your business owner's policy up to, you know, whatever limit that you have on the policy. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't like, this isn't going back this this kind of breaks up two parts of that business and interruption issue, which is not that you're looking at the physical damage part because the food has spoiled. You know, if you shut down the food or you can't operate and you have 30K worth of stuff in your fridge and, you know, you lose that stuff, that is not necessarily applicable from a physical damage standpoint. But where that would hit the road is why did you shut down? What is the cause of loss that led you to shut down? And if it is you had to shut down because of a virus or you had to shut down because of communicable disease or the governor had to shut you down, we're back to that square one position. Again, in my opinion, right. definitely consult right with where. your own insurance broker or claims analyst right where we were before, where that virus or communicable disease is excluded. And therefore, because the cause of loss is excluded, your coverage isn't going to be triggered. Yeah, it sounds like we're back to lobbying the state senators it, to, it all, to get a little, it, it, you, it all a little kinda, flexibility exactly, here. You know, in my in my opinion, it all kind of filters back to that same issue, which is that virus can communicable disease are excluded claims under the large majority of insurance policies. Again, not just for restaurants, but for anything. And that's yeah. it all kind of harkens back to that one issue. So, uh, you know, it needs to be covered, it needs to be caused by a covered cause of loss. And that's uh, unfortunately in the majority of insurance policies, not a covered cause of loss, which is why we need these efforts, grassroots, local, federal to get involved and have the insurance companies kind of get off the back bench and, and do something about it. Yeah. Another hot topic for us has been unemployment insurance. Is that something that you can speak to or is that a little bit different world than what you work in? It's, yeah, it's a little bit different um, than okay. what I work in. I can't really speak um, to educate, you know, I can't really offer too, edu too much of an educated opinion on it, uh, but this might fall into the workers comp realm, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's kind of a separate issue from commercial insurance. Okay, so we're going to skip that one, but I will say on April 2nd at 2 p.m., we have the law office of Arnold Porter, um, who is going to be coming in to talk about demystifying government assistance programs. And I know that they are definitely covering unemployment, both for the employer, what the rules and sort of 
benefits and risks and all that are, and then for your employee, what the benefits under the new care package um, are, uh, as well as like what happens when this is all over and we want to rehire our employees. So we'll save that for April 2nd. It'll be a conversation just like this one that'll go through unemployment, both for employer and employee, and then it'll go through SNAP and other food access programs, other um, loans that folks will be available to. So April 2nd, demystifying government assistant programs, come back for that one and we'll talk about um, unemployment insurance over there. Um, Evan, did you have something in the bottom to close out with before we go to questions? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talked about what to look yeah. for when choosing an insurance company and when choosing an insurance broker specifically. And that was one of my you know, questions. It's, it's, like, how do I know I have a good broker? I'm like, well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if he tells you he's good, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. It's, it's, you want to look for expertise at, within the industry. So, you know, using Thomas Keller as an example, the same the same insurance company that insures Popeyes is not going to insure per se. And the same insurance company that insures, you know, a more franchisee grab and go type chain is not going to insure a fine dining restaurant. So there are different insurance companies that meet different needs within each segment of the food and bev industry. So you want to make sure that not only the broker you're working with has knowledge and market access to be able to reach those markets, but that the carrier who you're working with specializes in the type of operations that you're doing. The barriers to entry to write an insurance policy are very low. A lot of different companies can write business owners policies for restaurants and a lot of them advocate and then want to do it. So, you know, it's important to find that right carrier that has the right coverages for your business and for how you operate specifically. And so, you know, how do you know if you have a good policy? It's, you know, I could, I, you know, maybe offline, Z, I could put together a list of, you know, nice additions, bullet points, things that we want to look for within a policy that we could be, you know, quote unquote good or things that are undesirable or, or whatever. But you just want to make sure that the person and the company you're working with do this frequently because, you know, as, as you know, it's, it's such a specialized niche and such a specialized industry that you, you want to make sure that whomever your partner is does this frequently because when, when the rubber hits the road as it is right now, you want to make sure that the, per, you know, that the person you're working with has done this before. So that's, yeah. That's, that's that's it, and you know how to know. I, I don't. It's hard. It's hard to tell. I don't want to be. You know, I don't want to be. a little so experience, right? Um, yeah, I do yeah, have yeah, uh, exactly. another question for you that that came in just now that I think is a great one. Um, we've talked about business interruptions, right? Are there any yeah. actions that folks have additionally, or when they straight up are closing their restaurant? There are some folks who are, you know pausing and there are other people who are like I'll never be able to reopen I'm I'm completely closing my business uh -huh. for good is there anything that changes for those folks with the insurance if their business closes for good no so what would happen is it would start from so the business interruption coverage would cover the claims that you or excuse me cover the expenses that you lost while you were unable to operate so let's say you shut down your business March 1st and let's say you reopened your business May 1st if, the, if it turns out that uh, b these business income claims are covered, whether the insurance company decides to pay them or whether the state or federal government gets involved, whatever happens, if you reopen on those two months, you would get paid for those two months, in theory, of lost, lost income. If you shut your doors on May 1st because, you know, you can no longer operate anymore, you would still get paid in theory for those two months, but you wouldn't get anything special or additional. It would be more the date that you decide to actually fold would be when those coverages, I'm, I, I'm assuming, would yeah. kick in. And again, I, I, I don't know that specifically because that creates kind of perverse incentives where you might not right. want to reopen and you just kind of stay closed for six months. So I don't know specifically how the insurance companies might handle it, but that's that's kind of my guess as to how it would play out. It's not as if, you know, I had to close on May 1 and the insurance companies are then going to pay me six, you know, six months additional. There's no real, there's no real additional benefit to having closed, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me too. Um, so it, it, there's no like business liquidation incentive yeah, there's or no like, like that. Yeah, there's no like severance pay kind of deal. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, another great question that we just had come in um, 
is, uh, you know, do you see any, exp obviously this is unprecedented times and a lot's gonna change when we do go back into business. Are there changes expected for the, insur for the insurance industry or policies in the aftermath of COVID-19? Is there anything you think it's a might really change? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the one thing that insurance companies are hedging with to everyone is, okay, you want us to pay these business income claims, it's going to cost us $200 billion a month, and you know what's going to happen to your premium at renewal, it's going to go way up, because we had to pay out all of these claims for all of this business interruption coverage. And that's kind of how the cookie's crumbling right now, because we didn't underwrite as an insurance company for these operations. We underwrote specifically as these things were excluded. So if we as a business are taking on $200 billion a month in additional liabilities, fine, this is the government rule, but everyone's premium at renewal is going to go up because of it. So yeah. I don't foresee a world, and this is just my own, my own interpretation, where they include virus, bacteria, communicable disease as a covered cause of loss. Uh, I think that's going to stay excluded, but if they do have to, you know, if there is some kind of mechanism that forces them to ultimately pay coverage, my guess is that everyone's premiums are going to go up, which is, uh, it sucks yeah. for everyone, but that's, you know, the logic is there from an insurance company saying, you know, what, what is, you know, it, it's a devil's bargain, right? right? What's the trade-off for everyone? Do you want this business interruption coverage covered or do you want, you know, to not cover this and then have premiums stay relatively flat or within the, you know, the cost? An inflation increase so right. it's hard to say how the industry it's 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 tough it's tough to say how the industry is going to change and um i i it really shakes down on what these you know what these state and civil laws are because the insurance company might you know there's different ways they can do it they might cap business income claims because the sba and other lenders via the care act are, are being so generous and then giving out so much stuff that they cap business income coverage at a certain amount uh, and therefore that offsets the premium. We, uh, we just don't know at this point how it's gonna shake down. But what we do know is that if insurance companies are forced to pay these claims and are forced to incur the you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of costs, premiums will likely go up at renewal, which yeah. no one wants to see. Not great so that's, you know, that's kind of the short answer, yeah. Mm. Are there any micro adjustments folks can be making? You know, every dollar counts right now. Like we're, we're hearing, should yeah. I be adjusting my workman's comp considering payroll interruptions? Like, is there any little micro things that could be doing to save a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do that. <laughs> what you do just that. Said is a Reduce good thing. Yeah, yeah, do that. Uh, you know, talk, well, workers' comp policies specifically are auditable. So what they do is, you know, they rate what you think your payroll is going to be. And then at the end of the policy term, they go in and they true it up. If you paid, if your payroll was greater, you pay more. If your payroll was less, you get money back. So um, let the insurance companies know that you're not operating this payroll for the next 60 or 90 days. And therefore, you know, hopefully they can adjust what you owe midterm so that instead of paying, you know, let's say $12,000 a year, $1,000 a month, you're only paying $6,000 a year. So there's little things you can do to augment, you know, the business, to augment the cost of the business while you're not operating. And, you know, also insurance policies are rated on sales. Business owners policies are rated a lot of times on liquor sales versus food sales, which have different rates. If you, you know, you do more, do more liquor sales, you're at a higher rate. Um, let the, your broker and let the insurance company know, listen, I thought I was going to do a million dollars in sales. I'm only doing 400,000. So even though those installments might get pushed back 60 days, if and when they come to fruition, the ultimate rating basis of the policy will be less, their installments will be less. I mean, there don't, what I, I mean, what I would advise is not being a passive observer. Call your broker, email your broker, piss them off. This is like, be, be annoying. Like this, this is what you should do in this situation because there are, this is your business and there are ways to go about, uh, you know, trying to save every last penny because in a time like this, it, it matters. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that covers uh, two more questions that just came in as well, which is, you know, some micro things we could be doing is call them up and let them know, you know, you're not running payroll at the same level. Can I get a savings yeah. there? Let them know, you know, I'm a restaurant that has a bar side. We're not serving any liquor, obviously, at all. And so can I reduce my liability on serving alcohol right now? Or how does that affect your liquor license? Yeah. Or does it not? Um, same with the amount of sales that you're doing, obviously letting know you're not getting business interruption insurance, but you're gone to, to go. And so you're, you know, you're doing a lot less business. So it's less expensive, yeah. less to insure. 
Um, and it yeah. sounds it sounds like that all those are all things that you can do through your broker through your insurance company to say like on a micro level every dollar counts and these are a couple places that I need you know to take a second second look and renegotiate here. Completely. And on a fundamental, you know, on a fundamental level, your insurance broker and your insurance company work for you. So if you have questions, get in touch, make these changes. You know, it's, it's almost like when you're at the doctor and you're going like afraid to, they say, is everything okay? And you just say yes, when you yeah. feel like crap and there's 10 things wrong with you. So be proactive, talk to these people, see what you can do, get creative. I mean, there are, there's no reason to sit back and be a passive observer. You should try to do what you can. And as V mentioned, there are a lot of ways and a lot of things that you can do. So that's, you know, that's, that's what I would advise. Get, you know, get creative. Why not? Excellent. So what I heard here is, um, you know, at the state level, we're pushing for business interruption overrides that could result in higher premiums. So that's still yet to be seen. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to file a claim, uh, you know, work with your broker and insurance company to file a claim for things that may be covered um, to help mm -hmm. qualify for loans. Have all your documents ready, especially your P&L, um, and make Important. those micro adjustments. Have everything ready. Yeah. Make those micro yeah. adjustments. Um, and we did get a couple questions about if you're taking on new clients, so we will send those directly to you. Thank <laughs> you very much for being here. Evan. Yeah, yeah. Um, of that course. Is, uh, our webinar and our questions for now, as we said, this will be recorded. We had um, the wonderful Megan Storms from our team taking notes, and so she will be putting those out. So we'll, anybody who missed the notes or wasn't able to join will get that information. Um, and I want to thank you again, Evan, for being with us and being so candid. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, folks feel a little better, got a little more info. Um, and hopefully we'll see y'all yeah. the rest of the week at the rest of the webinars. Um, if you see a topic that we've not covered that you'd love to see, um, just email us. You can email impact at jamesbeard.org or you can email us directly, vSpear and erothkrug at jamesbeard.org. Um, we're looking to make these conversations available to you and hopefully it helps. So Evan, thank you again so much for being here. I'll send you those folks who thank are you. hoping Thanks, taking new clients. Yeah, please, <laughs> please do. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate we'll it. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. All right. All right.